Hello, and welcome to my podcast, Good Grief. My name is Dr. Christine Malone, and in this podcast, we talk about trauma, tragedy, and survival. In each episode, I will interview someone that has gone through grief in some way, and we will discuss the impact it has had on their life. By sharing these stories, we hope that others won't feel alone should they be going through similar situations. Enjoy. All right, listeners, thanks for joining us today. My guest today is going to tell us about a tragic loss that she incurred. So um, if you would like to just tell us a little bit about yourself. Yeah, uh, my name is Melissa. Um, I live in the North Snohomish County area. I'm a clinical supervisor for um, a behavioral health clinic, um, again, here in Snohomish County. And yeah. Great. Well, I I know your story and I'm... Um, I've known you for some time, so I know your story, but uh, I'd like if you can just share uh, as much as you are feel comfortable with about what happened and the story of your loss. Yeah, of course. Um, so in 2017, um, I was pregnant with my first daughter and um, it was like a textbook pregnancy. Um, everything was so perfect. Um, I actually had made the solid decision and promised to myself that if everything went well, um, I would be committed to being a surrogate mother for two families because I was absolutely just overwhelmed with the joy and the experience of being pregnant. Um, and so, um, like I said, the pregnancy was nearly perfect. Um, and then uh, I got to my third trimester um, and I went to the doctor um, that morning was super busy. Um, I actually took my daughter's dad to the airport and woke up early, really, you know, just a really busy morning. And so um, when I went to my doctor's appointment that afternoon, um, the doctor had said, um, you know, normal, normal checkup, gonna listen to the heartbeat, you know, check everything that you, sh whatever happens in the third trimester. Um, and as she um, got out the fetal Doppler, she's just uh, kind of just roaming around my stomach. And it was just really, um, it was, it was this weird, eerie feeling of that something was wrong before I even knew that something was wrong. And, um, you know, she said she stopped uh, using the Doppler and she said, I I'm going to be right back. I'm going to step out of the room. And you know, like I said, I already felt like there was something wrong. And definitely at that point of the appointment, I was like, there's definitely something wrong. Um, and so she brought in another doctor. They kind of did the same thing, wandering around with the Doppler. And um, the the doctor finally said what felt like forever, but it was probably like five minutes was that um, your baby has no longer has a heartbeat. Um and um, after that, everything was kind of a blur and I'll do my best to <laughs> uh, tell the story after that because um, it just felt like everything was really like a big rush, but time was standing still at the same time. And um, another uh, tech came in to um, uh, confirm that there was no heartbeat to, to my baby. Um, at that time, like I said, my uh, daughter's dad was um, on an airplane. Uh, and so I, in my mind, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm so alone here. I'm cause I literally am alone here. Um, and, uh, so the MA sat with me and, you know, she held my hand and she, she was, she didn't say anything at all, which looking back now was just so, um, you know, like so appropriate at the time. Like not to say that I wouldn't mind if she was like, you know, do you need anything? So oh, sorry, all those things that people feel like they have to say, but honestly, don't need to. Um, and so she held my hand until my sister got there because she was the like geographically, she was the closest person that could get to me. Um, and then uh, I went down uh, to labor and delivery where they induced my labor. Um, and it took about uh, 24, a little over 24 hours until um, I then birthed my daughter. Um, she, uh, they had no idea uh, what had happened. Um, it was one of those things where the doctor was coming in every couple hours. 
you know, there's what felt like a million tests ran, um, all these things they were checking. And at one point, I remember the doctor saying, at, at this point, we're going to have to wait until she's born to see what happened. Um, and then she was born and it was an umbilical cord accident. Um, she had her umbilical cord wrapped around her. Um, and um, <clears throat> yeah, so um, I was... 31 weeks pregnant and um she was born on uh July 16th 2017. Wow and I know you already had picked out a name for the baby had you already prepared like a nursery you're all ready for her to come home and and all that. Yeah we were pretty much ready um her name is uh Jameson Quinley and um her it's so amazing you know she would be six years old this year and um I think sometimes her we say her name more than, uh, you know, my daughter that we have with us now. So, um, yeah, her nursery was ready. Um, I mean, we were, it was, it was the third trimester. We were just playing the waiting game. So, yeah. Um, so because you were in your third trimester, I'm certain everybody who was around you in person definitely knew that you were pregnant. So, um, how did you handle it, um, after the baby was born when people would ask you about the baby? Yeah, so um, I went at that time while I was uh, pregnant. I was actually I actually had braces, and so I was going back and forth to the orthodontist, which you know it's like every two or three weeks or whatever. So um, they were actually like along for the ride of my pregnancy. They were seeing like this baby bump happen. You know, we found out we were having a girl, and you know, I told them because it's like you're sitting there. You know, you just get you start to get that personal connection with, um, with the people there. And, um, when I, uh, after I had given birth to Jameson and, and obviously I didn't bring her with me to the appointment, um, they asked me, they said, Oh my gosh, did you have your baby? You know, like, how is she? And, 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 you know, mind you, it, this is just a couple weeks after it happened. I'm trying to get back to my normal routine and like the things I did on a daily basis which was a whole challenge in itself. Um, but I wanted, you know, to obviously make my orthodontist appointments. Um, you know, she said, Oh my gosh, you know, you had your baby. And I said, I did. And it was literally one of the first encounters that I ever had in public that wasn't, you know, surrounded by my close family and friends that were either there on the day that Jameson was born or, um, had, you know, had known through family and friends that, um, she wasn't with us. And so uh, I had this like sinking feeling and I felt like my mouth was open, but like no words came out. Cause I was like, in my mind, all I could think about was, oh my gosh, what do I say? What do I say? What do I say? And I don't think it was because I didn't want to tell them. It was because I, for the longest time when I had to, to tell anyone what had happened, I was afraid of what their reaction would be. Um, you know, I knew that I got to a point where I was strong enough to tell this story, you know, like I'm doing right now, but I was so afraid of what other people's reaction would be. I didn't want to see other people cry and I didn't want to see other people feel embarrassed that they asked me something about it. Um, I wanted it to be a conversation or, or, or for it to be comfortable because really after I lost my daughter, there's really nothing, nothing like that brings me more comfort than hearing people say her name or talk about her. And so um, when she did, when she did say, um, you know, oh my gosh, how's your baby? I said, unfortunately, sh she didn't make it. You know, I had a, I had a stillbirth and it was exactly how I pictured it would be. You know, they were like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I feel terrible for asking all these things. And it's like, and you know, I say, no, really like, it's okay. And whether people believe me or not that I say it's okay, I hope they do, because to me, it really is okay. Yeah, no, I I completely understand that. Um, now, I know you had a service for your daughter after she was born. So um, tell me why you did that and if that was somehow part of your process of of coming to, to, to terms with her death. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Jameson was you know, I was 31 weeks pregnant with her. So, you know, um, 
it was really tough. Um, she was born. Um, they have so many programs at the hospital that I never knew, nor did I ever want to know. That's not what I wanted to find out. Um, and, you know, there was a, a, a photographer that came to take pictures. Um, you know, they were a, a volunteer organization called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep that takes pictures um, for you to keep for yourself, obviously. Um, there's the Tears Foundation that would have helped us um, with like burial service um, or any kind of uh, whatever uh, services you chose for your child. Um, and really, I had no idea. I, I honestly had no idea what to do or what, you know, you know, what I was supposed to do. And what I found out really quickly is what each each person that goes through this kind of journey is supposed to do. Um, that's really not a thing. Like you do what you want to do um, in the moment. And um, that's just really what we felt like we wanted to do. I wanted um, to always have her. And so um, we uh, cremated her and then had a memorial service. And I think really what drove me to do the memorial service is to see how much um, it affected my family is like how much, um, how much they grieved for her. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and, you know, just, just being surrounded by my family and friends for that, that, you know, that process of the whole thing, um, there was such a big impact on them that not only did I want that healing um, to have that memorial service, but I also felt like it really helped a lot of the rest of the family. Yeah, yeah. And then I was there. It was absolutely beautiful. Um, well, the circumstances that it was, was absolutely a beautiful service and, and uh, event. I know you had another baby after Jameson. So I, I'm curious, you know, how did you feel during that pregnancy? I mean, the first one was perfectly fine. You were thinking you'd want to do surrogacy because it was so great. So I'm guessing second time around, you had other things on your mind. Yeah, absolutely. Um, gosh, I'm trying to think of something that describes it, but uh, it was so incredibly stressful with so much anxiety. Um, I felt like, my whole being was consumed about, around um, doing everything possible, you know, doing everything possible um, that I could to keep her safe in my, uh, in the womb. Um, I, you know, I tried my best to be really joyful and happy and because I really did want that experience. But um, to be honest, I really didn't, you know, I had the baby shower and all that stuff and everything was ready. Um, but I felt like I was w constantly waiting for bad news. And so when it was time to go to the hospital, I'm like, oh my gosh, I need to get so many things ready and I need to do so much. Uh, because I just felt like I, like, I couldn't prepare for it. Like it was, there was like this, this wall of that just built up inside of me that was like, don't, you know, don't let yourself get too excited. Um, and so, uh, I think, you know, after I had Jameson and then I got pregnant with Aubrey, um, even the doctor's appointments change and every week I had to go and get, um, NST tests and, uh, ultrasounds to make sure that everything was going well. Um, and then it actually did turn out that I did have Aubrey when I was a little, just, I had her six, um, 36 weeks and six days, um, because, uh, we had an amniotic fluid, uh, issue. So, yeah. yeah. Um, how about, um, your relationship? Was there anything with the relationship that, that changed, um, those more, I know I've talked to other couples that have lost a child and I know the grief process for both is very different. Um, and so that need to support one another and so on. So did you feel like the, your relationship had, um, damaged anything like that was brought problematic with that? Oh, absolutely. I feel like we, um, I feel like we lived through a nightmare and it was really hard to wake up from, um, our relationship ultimately ended and we are great. Uh, we have a great co-parenting relationship with Aubrey, um, but I just didn't feel like that we could get, we could get through that and continue on 
um, with our lives in any kind of similar way whatsoever. So okay. we are now great co-parents. <laughs> yeah, that's important for little Aubrey. Um, I know for me, having lost a child, uh, when people ask me how many children I have, I am sometimes, uh, depends on the person, sometimes I, I will share how many I've had. Um, and sometimes that will then lead to people asking me about, well, what about the one here, right? So when, when people ask you, how many children do you have? Do you have a, a set answer or does it depend on the situation? Um, it definitely depends on the situation. It's a, it's a hundred percent read the room every time. Um, I know, uh, that I, after I had Aubrey, um, actually it might've been before, um, uh, that's probably the most difficult conversation to have is when you have, is when I was pregnant with Jameson, I had her, but you know, she's not physically here with me. And so people say, how many kids do you have? And I'm like, oh my gosh, do I say none? And then like have this hunkering guilt or do I say one and then have to explain the situation? And I believe at one point I reached out to you, Christine, and I was like, what do I do? Because I was like, I know that, you know, similarly, di but different, we were in the same situation at one point in our lives. And I, I clearly remember saying like, Christine, what do I do? <laughs> and then um, after I had Aubrey, um, I feel like it got much easier because I could obviously say, you know, Aubrey's here. I have one child. Um, but any, to be honest, any chance I get to talk about Jameson and, and, and in the, in the little life, um, that we had with her, um, I will, it's just definitely like a read the room situation. Like if I'm, you know, standing in line at the grocery store and the lady behind me is like, oh my gosh, is she, she an only child? I'm like, oh yeah, you know, she's, that this is her but if I'm sitting somewhere um in a group or uh you know somewhere where where I feel like it's more appropriate to go into that conversation because as soon as you open up that conversation there's a hundred questions coming at you um then I will talk about her um when I write about her or when I am like doing like some kind of presentation or something like that. I do say that I have one daughter here on earth and one in heaven or something like that so that I get to, to honor her. Yeah. I, I refer to my son as that he lives in my heart. So I have, I have one that lives in my heart um, because like you, I, I, I like to talk about my son that passed away. He's, he's a part of who I am. Um, have, have, remind me how old is Aubrey now? Um, She'll be four next month. Four. So how, do you talk to her about Jameson? Yeah, actually, um, yes, she definitely knows that she has a big sister. Um, not that she might not understand it yet, but um, we do have the pictures <clears throat> from um, from the hospital that um, we uh, keep with us. Um, there is one picture that is just of Jameson's face, and like on Mother's Day, um, things like that. I, you know, we take pictures with Aubrey and the picture of Jameson. And then um, we have like a little, um, like a memory corner um, in our living room. And they're those um, willow tree dolls. Um, mm -hmm. uh, willow tree dolls. We have those and then a little bracelet that uh, Jameson wore and um, the picture of her. And so she'll go over there and she'll play with that stuff. And, and she'll, um, she'll talk about her sister and yeah so yeah no I had the same experience with my youngest son was born four years after his brother died and throughout his childhood he's known he had this other brother and we visited the cemetery together and and this is someone he never met and so on so yeah I think that's probably pretty healthy um I'd like to know I mean knowing what you have gone through and and you've come so far now to where you are today um, telling your story and, and reaching out to other people and so on. If you could go back in time to when all this was happening to you, um, what would you say to someone in that situation or what would you advise them or let them know? Yeah. Um, gosh, it's hard to say. Cause of course, you know, I never want to, I never wanted to be here. Um, but there is such a huge community of families that go through this um and I would have never known unless you know it happened to me um just you know be so gentle with yourself and and the journey of a mother grieving their child is probably the loneliest experience I've ever been through um even though surrounded by 
surrounded with so much love and so much support because, you know, as you know, my family is like amazing and we're all so close. Um, at the end of the day, the, the journey is, is really no one, no one's but my own and, you know, others, um, it's just your own. And so, um, I don't want to say that dads don't grieve, grieve and brothers and sisters don't and grandma and grandpa doesn't, but I do fully believe that there is a specific, uh, grieving of a mother. And, um, especially because Jameson was, uh, in, in, you know, growing inside of me and she didn't, no one got to see who she was until, you know, she had already passed away and she was a stillborn. Um, no one will know what it felt like with her inside of my stomach. No one will know, um, you know, the things that I did for just me and her and things like that. And so, um, you know, just be gentle with yourself and, um, do what, do what makes you feel better and don't worry about what other people, um, think about what that is that you're doing. Um, I was, you know, after she passed away, not, you know, we've always, I can't say we've always, but we've kind of, uh, been in and out of church and, and, you know, um, went back and forth and, and tried to find that place, uh, the, the place, you know, to call our church home. And, and I really, really looked for that after, um, after Jameson was born. And, and I was, I felt so, uh, so comforted, uh, comforted there, um, that I was doing everything I could possibly do to feel closer to Jameson. Um, and so, uh, I really got involved in church and, and I got baptized and, um, and, and, uh, just felt uh, so comforted there. So, so always do what makes you feel better. You know, it's, it takes a long time and, and people say that the time will heal or, or your healing process. Um, I don't know. I'm not really sure if there is a process because it's, you know, this year will be six years. And sometimes I catch myself feeling like it was yesterday and I'll cry. Like I felt like I cried that day. Um, um, some other, you know, just other things that I've, I've done is when you feel so lonely in that experience, you, you're constantly reaching out to find something else. And so knowing that that huge community was out there, I thought the closest or the, not the closest, but the easiest thing I could do was um, resort to social media and find those people that were feeling like me. And um, I created an Instagram page called Down Here Looking Up and really connected with a lot of moms that I was like, okay, I do feel lonely right now, but I am, um, I, I am going through something that someone else is going through right now. Yeah. Um, I would say, I mean, I completely agree with you that it's not a process. I, I call it a journey. So, and on any journey, you know, you can have good days and bad days and there's days, um, you know, my son would be 20, three years old this year and he died at the age of four so there's days when i i get taken back to that time as well where it's like oh my goodness wow how much time has passed and 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 i really um resist people saying things well you should be over it or you should be moving on or um you should be it should be no big deal because you have another child now so everything's just fine right and those comments are insanely painful <laughs> as I'm sure you've had some, some of those, it's just like, why would you say that to me? I mean, and I, I believe, I know for, for fact that people mean well, they don't mean to say things that hurt you. They, they, they just don't know what to say, but like mm -hmm. that in your story, sometimes you don't say anything. You're just there. You're just there in, in the quiet, just be there. Right. Yeah. Well, thank you again so much for meeting with me today. It's always a pleasure to see you for one thing, but yes. Um, so, so happy that you would share your story. Um, anything else you want to add before we go? Um, let's see. Um, I think, um, you know, for anyone that's going to listen to this, that goes through the same process is just, um, along the lines of like, do, do what, what brings joy to you or what makes you feel comforted is, is every year on Jameson's birthday, you know, I don't, it's, it's not something that I do every single day, but find something special, like make that special moment for yourself that like, um, that makes you kind of encompass the whole journey into one, in, into, into something. And so, um, 
every year on her birthday on July 16th, um, I, I craved Mexican food my entire pregnancy and I didn't care what, what kind it was. I would eat anything, um, Mexican. And so, um, we go, I, me and my daughter, um, go out to eat, uh, Mexican food. Um, my other craving was strawberry ice cream, but that was definitely like a food inversion. Like I tried to eat it a couple months later and I was like, wow, that's really disgusting. Um, and then uh, we take, uh, you know, like three $20 bills to Target on her birthday. I put a little encouraging note that says like, you're doing great or congratulations or something. I'll wrap it up with my like Instagram handle to see if anybody ever like reaches out to say that they got them. Then I just put them inside a diaper box wow. um, because at the time, <laughs> At the time, um, I would have done anything to be able to have been buying diapers, but um, that that wasn't how this all ended. And so um, I just I just wanted to do something uh, for somebody else that was that was so blessed with their baby. Oh, that's amazing! You make me tear up. That's amazing. That's amazing. Thank you for doing that. That's a lovely idea, and it's given me some thought of what I might like to do on on my son's birthday. That typically I don't go out and do things like that but um i do like to remember him so yeah. thank you again for being here i really appreciate you give your daughter a big hug i will it's good to see you thank you for listening to this episode of good grief to hear more about my personal story please pick up a copy of the book the spider killer a memoir of trauma tragedy and survival you can find the book on amazon and kindle